On the topic of A-B testing, if you work as data scientist at a web company, you'll probably be asked to spend some time analyzing the results of A-B tests. These are basically controlled experiments on a website to measure the impact of given change. So let's talk about A-B tests in the following context. If you're going to be a data scientist at a big tech company, this is something you're going to definitely be involved in because people need to run experiments to try different things and eventually how to measure the result. It's actually not as straightforward as most people think of it. What is an A-B test? Well, it's a controlled experiment that you usually run on a website. It can be applied to other contexts as well. But usually we're talking about a website and we're going to test the performance of some change to the website. You basically have a control set of people that see the old website and a test group of people that see the change to the website. And the idea is to measure the difference in behavior between these two groups and use that data to actually decide whether this change was beneficial or not. For example, suppose you own a business that has a website. It basically sells licensed software to people. Right now, it's nice and friendly orange bottom. What if you change it to blue? What changes you're gonna see in the behavior of your customers? So in this example, if you want to find out whether blue would be better, how do you do that? This is basically A-B testing. Intuitively, maybe that might be capture people's attention more, or intuitively, maybe people are more used to seeing orange by bottom and are more likely to click on it. But our internal biases or our opinion doesn't really matter. What matters is how people react to this change on the actual website. And that's what A-B testing does. A-B testing will split people up into people who see the orange bottom and people who see the blue bottom. And you can then measure the behavior between these two groups and how they might differ and make uh, our decision on what color should be. You can test all sorts of things with A-B testing. These include design change. These can be changes in the color of the bottom or placement of the bottom or the layout of the page. UI flow. So maybe you're actually changing the way that your purchase pipeline works and how people check out on your website and you can actually measure the effect of it. Algorithmic changes. Let's consider, consider the example of doing a movie recommendation using recommender system. Or maybe I want to test one algorithm versus another. Instead of relying on error matrix, matrix and our ability to do a train test, what I really care about is driving purchases or rentals or whatever it is on this website. The A-B test can let me directly measure the impact of this algorithm on the end result that I actually care about and not just my ability to predict movies that other people have already seen. And anything else you can dream up to. Really, any change that impacts how users interact with your site is worth testing. Maybe it's even making a website faster or it could be anything else. Pricing changes. This one gets a little bit controversial. You know, in theory, you can experiment with different price points using an A-B test and see if it actually increases volume to offers for the price difference or whatever. But use that one with caution. If customers catch when that other people are getting better prices than they are, for no good reason, they're not going to be very happy 
keep in mind going pricing experiment can have a negative backlash and you don't want to be in that situation. In modern data analytics, deciding whether two numerical samples come from the same underlying distribution or population is called A-B testing. The name refers to labels of the two samples, sample A and sample B, smokers and non-smokers. The table birds contain the following variables of 1,174 mother baby pairs. The baby's birth weight in ounces, the number of gestural days and the mother's age and other variables are all included in that table. Import necessary libraries. We're going to visualize some data. We're going to compare two samples. Let's read our data frame and take a look at the bird's data frame. So here you have the bird weight. You have other variables involved in this table. Maternal smoker, false, it means that we don't have smokers and true means that we have smokers. One of the aims of the study was to see whether maternal smoking was associated with the birth weight. Let's see what we can say about the two variables. We'll start by selecting just birth weight and maternal smoker. There are 715 non-smokers among the women in this study. 459 were smokers. So basically, what are we going to do? We're going to start by selecting the relevant columns, which in this case are maternal smokers and birth weight. Then we group the data by maternal smokers, which helps us to count how many non-smokers and smokers are in the data set. So if you run the line of code, you see you have the number of non-smokers to be 715 and the number of smokers, which is 459. Let's move on to the next line. Let's look at the distribution of the birth weights of the babies of the non-smoking mothers compared to those of the smoking mothers. We're going to use a histogram. To generate two overlaid histograms, we will use hist with the optional group argument, which is a column label or index. The rows of the table are first grouped by the column, and then a histogram is drawn from each one. So this is what we see here. Take a look at these two histograms. The yellow one is saying that, hey, maternal smoker is true. It means that the yellow histogram represents the sample of smoking. And then the blue one shows that you have non-smokers. As you can see, the center of these two histograms is a little bit different. The center of the smokers is around here, and the center of non-smokers is around here. So we see a slight chance that there are actually differences in the weight. But is it just due on chance, or is this basically a difference between them? The distribution of the weights of the babies born to mothers who smoked appeared to be slightly to the left-hand side. The weights of the babies of the mothers who smoked seem lower on average than the weights of the babies on the non-smokers. This raises the following question, as you mentioned, whether the difference reflects just chance variation or there is an actual difference in the distribution in the larger population. Could it be that there is no difference between the two distributions in the population, but we are seeing a difference in the samples just because of the mothers who happen to be selected. So, let's go to the next step. What are our hypotheses here? We can try to answer this question by testing a hypothesis. 
the chance model that we will test say that there is no underlying difference in the population and the distribution in the samples are different just due to chance. Formally, this is the null hypothesis. There is no difference between these two distributions. We're going to have to figure out how to simulate useful statistic under this hypothesis. But as we start Let's just stick the two natural hypotheses here. The null hypothesis says in the population, the distribution of birth weights of babies is the same for mothers who don't smoke as for mothers who do. The difference in the sample is due to chance. And the alternative hypothesis, the complement of this says, no, there is a difference. In the population, the babies of the mothers who smoke have a lower birth weight on average than the babies of the non-smokers. Let's begin. How do we test our hypothesis here? We need a test statistic, as you remember. The alternative hypothesis compares the average birth weights of the two groups and says that the average for the mothers who smoke is smaller. Therefore, it is reasonable for us to use the difference between the two group means as our statistic. We'll subtract in the order. So average weight of smoking group minus the average weight of the non-smoking group. Small values of the statistic will favor the alternative hypothesis. The observed value of the test statistic is about negative 9.27. Can run the line of code. And basically, we have our bird weight average for the non smokers is about 123, for smokers is about 114. So basically, the difference of means function, we are creating a function to calculate the difference in the mean values of a numerical variable between two groups in the data set. We can break down this line of code, but basically, what are we looking at? We need to check that the function is working and we can check it for the observed difference between the mean birth weights of the two groups in the sample. It basically match with what we calculated before. Very good, so our function works perfectly. Now, let us make the prediction about the statistic under the null hypothesis. To see how the statistic should vary under the null hypothesis, we have to figure out how to simulate the statistic under the hypothesis. A clever method based on random permutations does the job for us. If there were no difference between the two distributions in the underlying population, then whether a birth weight has the label true or false with respect to the maternal smoking should make no difference to the average. The idea then is to shuffle all the labels randomly among the mothers. This is called random permutation. Shuffling ensures that the count of true labels doesn't change, and nor does the count of false. This is important for comparability of the simulated differences of means and the original difference of means. We will see later in the course that the sample size affects the variability of sample mean. Let's take the difference of the two new group means, the mean weight of the babies, whose mothers have been randomly labeled smokers and the mean weight of babies that for mothers who are non-smokers. This is a simulated value of the test statistic under null hypothesis. 
Let's see how to do this. It's always a good idea to start with the data. We can reduce the table to have just the columns that we need. So let us take a look at our result. Here we have the birth weight 120 non-smoker, 113 non-smoker, 128 smoker, 108 smoker, and so on. So as you can see, you have some values deleted for the sake of seeing some part of the data and analyzing it. There are 1,174 rows in the table. To shuffle all labels, we will draw a random sample of 1,174 rows without replacement. Then the sample will include all the rows of the table in random order. We can use the table method sample with the option of with replacement to be false because we don't want any replacement. We don't have to specify a sample size because by default sample draws as many times as there are rows in the table. So let's shuffle it. And then We are creating a new table, original and shuffle. It contains basically maternal smokers, birth weight, and shuffle label. So now the shuffle label is false, the maternal smoker is false, and this is the birth weight. Take a look at the second row. The shuffle label is true. Maternal smoker is false. And the birth weight is 113 and so on. Each baby's mother now has a random smoker, non-smoker label in the column shuffled label. While her original label is in maternal smoker. If the null hypothesis is true, all the random rearrangements of the labels should be equally likely. Let's see how different the average weights are in the two random label groups. Perfect. Let's run our line of code. The breakdown, this step basically calculates the average birth weight for two randomly shuffled group, birth weight and shuffle label. And here you have the shuffle label, and then you calculate in the average. The average of the two randomly selected groups are quite a bit closer than the average of the two original groups. We can use our function difference underscore of underscore mean 